Michael Shalik here for SCScoops.com. My guest at this time is QT Marshall. We're talking about AEW Blood and Guts this Wednesday night on TNT. QT is in one of the featured matches against his former dear friend, Cody Rhodes. We'll get to all that, but QT, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. You're welcome. And uh, we've just made it official as of today. It will be QT Marshall. I was never in the position to correct everybody. I'm in the position now. Frankly, don't give a crap what other people think. That is my name. That's how we're going to pronounce it. It's not your part. All right. You didn't know. The record has been corrected. QT Marshall. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, it, so you. aside from what we see on television, you are the director of creative coordination in AEW. Could you tell us a bit about your role and what that job entails? Uh, basically anything creative. So I deal with uh, hair and makeup, the seamstress, the local talent, uh, outside projects, anything that would they, you know, like they need to know which female wrestlers are going to be working first. And I usually know that before most others. Uh, mm -hmm. So I get that information to them and I, I oversee all four of those departments. Um, I work side by side with Tony Khan on certain things. Uh, most of the stuff that we do between Dark Elevation, Dynamite, um, you know, obviously he works with the EVPs and stuff like that, but I'm more of it. Uh, the guy that puts everything on paper and, you know, we time everything out and we make sure it works. So it's a fun job. It's, it's takes a little out of me. You can definitely tell when we're on the second day of a loop, but uh, you know, it's fun. It's my dream job. That's awesome. You must be very organized. <laughs> no, no, but here's the thing. I definitely love professional wrestling and I love being in the ring and wrestling. And I know that if my backstage job starts to take a turn for the worse, they're not going to release me from my backstage job. They're probably just going to ask me to stop wrestling so I can concentrate more on that. So it's a, it's a real um, easy way for me to be good at this job. Let's put it that way. That's cool. Um, so AEW has grown by leaps and bounds since the launch in 2019. Dynamite is now unopposed on Wednesday nights. We're kind of rounding the corner with COVID and fans are expected back in the arenas this summer. It feels like we're on the cusp of like a new chapter. You know, there's so many things that um, AEW has ahead of it, which might have been put on hold because of the current configuration. It, there must be a pent up excitement behind the scenes. Is there a feeling like we're in a bit of a holding pattern until things fully open up and then it's like gangbusters? I mean, of course there is deep down, but because obviously what we do is for the, the live crowd. Um, but we're also catering to all the fans that watch on TV every week. And you say we're unopposed. We are unopposed when it comes to wrestling, but we're not unopposed when it comes to, you know, guys' grocery games or or the real world road rules challenge or the president like last week. So, you know, we do compete, obviously, with other TV shows as well. So we just try to put out the best product. Um, with that being said, I think the live audience definitely does um, help the performers, right? And it, it helps give the overall, and when AEW first started, when Dynamite first started, a sold out crowd in Washington, DC, that's what made AEW Dynamite so special. Um, of course, the wrestling was um, was elite, but it was definitely that those fans, those diehard, they just wanted an alternative and we were able to give them that. And they've stuck through, through this whole pandemic era of wrestling. And we've started to open up a little bit and we've had more and more fans in Jacksonville and I mean, I think it's safe to say we're all excited to hopefully get back on the road and and see these fans again. I mean, we've kind of made Jacksonville a little bit of a territory, um, but and as much as we love it and I've become accustomed to the hotel, to the, you know, to the, to the venue uh, and all that stuff, the local restaurants, everything. Um, I think we're just excited to get back on the road and kind of go back to what we thought was the, the norm, which is now. You know, the norm now is just going to Jacksonville and going to work. Any sense of what a timeline looks like? I mean, you can go to the AEW website. They've got dates for certain shows, but there hasn't been like a real we're back on this date kind of thing. Any, any yeah, sense I, there? I don't really, you know, I try to stay out of it. That's not, that's one department I'm not involved in. So I kind of ask like, 
if I get, uh, you know, an email and it says something about, hey, we're going to go back to wherever, let's just throw a venue out there. Let's say Newark, because that's where I'm from, New Jersey. So I can't wait to go there. And we sold, what was it, 15,000 seats. Uh, so when I get an email like that, I'm like, hey, and then they're like, well, yes, we have rescheduled because this, that and the other. But that doesn't mean it's a definite. Like we've rescheduled. And, and then I just leave it at that because, again, not my area. Don't want to get too excited for something that's not going to happen. Um, so I just, plus I, I, I like the genuine feeling of, you know, being surprised about certain things. So I just don't want my hopes to get up just like everyone else's, you know? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, so let's talk about the school a bit. Um, as one of the head coaches at the nightmare factory training facility, you're at the cutting edge of what professional wrestling is going to look like in three, five, ten years. You know, the people that are at the school, they might be main eventing all out one day so what do you look for in a prospective talent that's like a multi-part question so like just generally what do you look for um what's more important natural athletic ability or charisma uh well if you listen to the fans they'll tell you that i have absolutely zero charisma so uh, i think that you know we just try to build a great foundation uh, our camps are 12 week beginner camps, whether you've been wrestling or not, they, they, we still teach you from getting in the ring uh, till the end of the 12 weeks where we do our showcase. So we try to really set you up for success. You know, we, we teach you uh, the importance of strength and conditioning, um, nutrition, you know, your gear, right? Every single thing that we try to do is to present you as a superstar, as a main event player, because working behind the scenes of a wrestling company. That's the one thing I try to explain is that we don't, from a company's perspective, we're not looking to hire mid card wrestlers, uh, low card, low tier wrestlers. We're not, there are people that fall there, right? Because you have your Cody's, your Kenny Omega's and, and John Moxley's and all these guys, Chris Jericho's. But when we look to hire people, we want to hire the next Chris Jericho, who is whoever they are as themselves. Unfortunately, when Chris Jericho is still there, they are going to fall lower down on the on the ladder. Um, so and a lot of it is just your your look. Right. And it's not about having a six pack or anything like that. It's about what do you catch somebody's eye? And that could listen, if you don't have a six pack, it could be your gear. It could be your hair. It could be your your headband. It could be anything. So we just have to pull that out of you. Uh, for, but when you when we take everybody in, the first thing we do is, you know, and Cody was really good about this. When, when we were teaching is it's very much, you know, wrestling is a one strike industry. So be good people, you know, and good things usually do happen. Um, so we really try to stress that. And then we just have fun and the people that work hard, they, they reap the rewards. The ones that don't, it is what it is. I mean, we've had people from our camps already on dark on dynamite. I mean, it's absurd. Some of these people have been wrestling 14, 15 weeks. Their third match ever is on AEW dark. Like, took me 16 years to get to AEW, you know? but cool. you know, a lot of it is trial by fire and Hey, let's see what they got. And some of them have that, that it, and we just want to present it out there. And also that's part of the learning process. See how they are backstage, you know, and, and we have the fortunate ability to bring them with us and let them try it, especially in this, this era that we're in when we're filming, you know, episodes of dark and, and uh, elevation that are 12, 13 matches long. So you need a lot of local talent for that. So, and luckily Atlanta is local to Jacksonville. It's a five hour ride and mm-hmm. if they will jump in their car and do it, you know, God bless them. So now these camps are mostly for real beginners. You prefer working with the completely raw talent that way you don't have to like undo teachings of elsewhere that might not be aligned with your philosophy. Is that usually like what you prefer? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot easier to teach people from scratch, to teach them our philosophies. Uh, but again, you know, there are a lot of trained, quote unquote, trained wrestlers out there. Um, and sometimes they just weren't taught the right way or they just weren't brought in the right way. Maybe they have the fundamentals. They just can't figure out why they're not getting those opportunities. And sometimes it's, hey, you're a knucklehead. And in, in the nice way to put it, you know, you're just not understanding that this isn't the way business is conducted. Um, because again, at the end of the day, this is a business. Um, so, and like my mother always said, if it, if it doesn't make sense, it won't make dollars. So it, everything has to make sense. And you just, again, you know, by, by having these kids out there and giving them this chance, 
to be retrained. It also doesn't take away half of our profits as well. You know what I mean? Like, sure. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to cut people out. You know, we want to give everyone the same chance. So we just ask that when they get there, that they understand that this is a beginner's course. Um, we are going to teach you from getting in the ring. Please just, just bear with us because we will get to the fun stuff. And at the end of the day, like I said, the showcase is what everyone looks forward to. We try to give them the best experience possible. I mean, first showcase, I had two young ladies drive my, you know, hundred thousand dollar car into the building and then someone poured some kind of soda all over it, you know? And, you know, I wasn't too happy about that, but Hey, this was one an experience that they're never going to forget. And um, I wouldn't do that now looking back, but then it was okay. That's great. Um, there's so many other aspects of whether it's professional sports or entertainment, um, collegiate athletes, rappers, celebrities, it seems like more than ever, now more than ever, so many other people outside the industry are kind of flirting with the world of professional wrestling, engaging interest, whether it's talking trash on social media or yeah. even getting involved. Um, is there anybody out there in the world of sports or entertainment, not wrestling, that you see just like, man, if I got their, my hands on them, I could really make something out of them in the, in the world of professional wrestling? I mean, there's a lot of personalities out there that I feel would draw good money when it comes to what we do. Um, they'd probably have to be heels, you know, they're, they're definitely going to be people that people will pay to see them get beat up, you know, but Shaq, perfect example. I mean, he walked into the facility. I spoke to him. Um, I was training Jade at the time. We spoke for about 10 minutes and I told him, hey, you, you can do this. Really? Yeah, you can do this. Put a little bit of work into it, man. Just put a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work and it'll be something truly special. And that was the one thing he was very worried about. He didn't want it to come off cheesy and he didn't want to um, insult what we do, right? He didn't want to insult the fans and insult the wrestlers in the back. That's why he didn't wear wrestling gear. He just wanted to wear sweatpants. He was like, I'm not going to, you know, cosplay what these guys do. I'm here to fight. I'm here to fight Cody. I say, hey, I, you're seven feet tall. I'm not arguing with you. You know, you dress however you want. And I guess 10, 10 times he was at the school, maybe total. Wow. Hmm. I mean, he did pretty good, you know, to go out there on live TV. He did a lot better than uh, most, of, most of our campers. But he has an act like he has, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, it's in his blood to entertain. Let's put it that way. And he was able to do so, so. Yeah, I mean, you look at some of the most hated hated athletes, let's put it that way. Like, they'd be great, you know? So, I mean, it all depends where you're from. I'm a Yankee fan, so I look at someone like Bryce Harper as someone that, that would be sure. a great deal. But if you if you like the Phillies, you know, or the Nationals, whatever team he's on now, you know, you'd probably dislike them or you'd love them, you know? So. Gotcha. All right, so shifting to more current events, on the March 31st edition of Dynamite, you turned on Cody Rhodes I mean, you guys have this long history, worked together for many years, very closely, and you completely beat the shit out of him. You know, you spoke about being tired of living in his shadow, but could you just elaborate on what your reasoning was and, you know, why this couldn't be worked out other ways? Sure. Uh, long story short, I was hired as Cody Rhodes' assistant. I wasn't offered two contracts. Not that there's anything wrong with that, like Brandon Cutler or Michael Nakazawa. I, I wasn't offered those. I was offered a in entry-level gig as Cody Rhodes' assistant. Um, within seven, eight weeks, I worked my way up to associate producer, uh, still with the mindset that I would wrestle one day. And I remember bringing it up to him at his house. And you would have thought we were going to get into a fist fight because in his mind, he gave me the dream job that I always wanted, which was in wrestling. And if you watch my documentary, it was all about just getting a job in professional wrestling. So to an extent, he's right. That doesn't mean you can't have it all. And unfortunately, when the narrative that has been always brought up was that I'm here because of Cody. Well, that is half true. The other half is that my boss, Tony Khan, asked me to wrestle. So that's how I got my first opportunity to wrestle. Then there was another opportunity. There was another opportunity. And I just kept doing well because I'm 
a professional wrestler and I train all the time for this. And then one thing led to another and I started teaming with Dustin and then I realized like, okay, after seeing the fans response to all this stuff, I'm never getting out of this guy's shadow. There's nothing I can do. I can jump off these ladders. Um, you know, I can work as hard as I want behind the scenes. Like it doesn't matter. I'm only always going to be known as a Cody guy. I'm here because of Cody. And unfortunately, like, so I asked him, I said, hey, and this is a genuine thing that I asked him. What if we wrestled? You know what I mean? Like, and I can show people that I belong in the ring with someone like you. And as he came out and spoke to me and told me he was my best friend and this, that, and the other, I started to think like, okay, well, shoot, what if this doesn't work out for me? What if maybe, I, you know, he just mops the floor with me? Well, so then I went to the school. I talked to a couple of the other students and I told them what was going to happen. Hey, if this goes down like this, this is what I need you to do. And of course, because I've looked out for these guys, Anthony Agogo, I've looked out for since day one, since they sold him this dream on moving to America um, and Cody and they were going to train him. Well, QT has been training him since day one. Camarado, a guy that from almost the beginning of his wrestling uh, in New Jersey at the Monster Factory, I was training him. Then he went on to NXT. And then during the budget cuts, he was one of the guys that I always had an eye on. I called him right up. I said, Nick, I think we can do something for you. Why don't you do this, this? Just please listen to me. Follow me. You know I'm your coach. You know I'm always going to lead you in the right direction. And then there was Solo. Solo is a guy that's been around for years, right? And people got mad that I said he's not going to be known as somebody's girl or boyfriend. It's true. That's what the fans said. Not me. I didn't know that he was still with that girl. You know what I mean? Or not with I knew that he was a professional wrestler that I had met in 2013 when I was in Ring of Honor. And he was somebody that had the heart to do it. And he moved all the way to Atlanta for two months to get his training in and to so we could figure out what he was missing. So th that was the team that I chose. And um, you know, unfortunately, the guns, Cody, Dustin, you know, they they we left them laying and you know, and now the story has started. And unfortunately for Cody, it's not going to end well for him on Wednesday because there's nothing I want in my career more than the respect of the fans. And the only way I'm going to be able to get that is to beat Cody at Blood and Guts. That's it. There's nothing else I can do. So, you know, Cody's in-ring style in and out. I'm sure you've helped him prepare for some of his big biggest matches. I'm sure you sure. trained together. How are you preparing specifically for Cody Rhodes? So I'm the opposite. I've been training with Anthony Agogo and I've been learning. I mean, we watched the other night, Lee Johnson probably swung at me. I just tweeted about it 18 times, right? That's what uh, the guy with the tennis racket said 18 times. He swung at Marsh tail and my hand was blocking every single one of them. So when people want to know how, how my face looked the same way, 10 seconds later, it's because I blocked every single punch because Anthony Agogo, it's a, he's an Olympic boxer. And I told him, I said, if I go into this, I, I went into the exhibition as a wrestler. Didn't really work out. Luckily, we had plan B. So this one, I'm going to go in a little bit differently. I think you're going to see things that you've never seen from someone like me. Um, you know, and, and honestly, I'm still toying with the idea of not even having the factory out at ringside with me. Because this is something I want to do on my own. Cool. So after you dispose of Cody Rhodes... I would imagine that your primary focus is going to be the factory, a go, go sure. Camarado and solo. It's a very talented group. Each guy has their own strengths, but AEW has no shortage of talented groups. So aside from just the raw talent that each guy has, how do you plan on setting the factory apart from the other groups? Well, I think the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that I'm not worried about stepping on people's toes. Uh, genuinely not, because I have my backstage gig. So I think I'm okay there. But on top of that, like I sat back for two years, two years uh, and watched everybody coast in AEW. And not everybody, but there's a, a good, you know, half of the roster. And I know the world has been shut down and this, that, and the other, and it's, and it's been rough. But the factory, the nightmare factory has been open. And for those people that wanted to get better, it's been open to any single person on the entire AEW roster. And we've had a couple of people show up, but the ones that really wanted are the ones that are going to train. I'm not saying that people don't train back at home, but the majority don't. 
the majority don't put the extra work in. So I think between me not being worried about stepping on people's toes and also realizing that these guys have made a commitment to me as, as their leader, right? So I have to go above and beyond to show them that this is worth their investment, just like I did with the training facility. You know, from day one, I always invested hard into that, into that facility to make sure that these kids got the most out of it. The same thing with the factory, Camarado, Gogo, Solo, they understand that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to, to give them the spotlight. And a lot of people right now, oh, the spotlight, why is it on QT? Why? It's on me because I'm frigging good at what I do, right? Undefeated in 2021. So, and people say, oh, well, it doesn't, you know, a go-go helped you or a Camarado helped. Listen, wins and losses matter in AEW and I'm winning. So uh, when, I, when I think about it and I look at these guys that I've basically, you know, helped give them the spotlight now, I know that they're, they're going to stop at basically nothing to make sure that we are the most successful faction in AEW. Great. And the next school begins, I believe, in July? July 5th. So we're still uh, we're trying to figure out some business sides of it, right? Because it's my school. It was always my school. Mm-hmm. Cody partnered. Uh, so things are a little awkward right now, right. but you know, we make it work. We make it work. You know, he's there certain days. I'm there certain days. None of us are there certain days. So we, we make it work. We had July 5th. Uh, we are actually just looking at some applications now. So, you know. All right. Excellent. I mean, the talent that we've already seen come out of the school has been very impressive. So I know everyone can't wait to see what the next batch of recruits has in store for us. And I saw the, uh, the show that you guys put on yesterday with uh, the latest class. And that was really. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then really- uh, tonight on elevation, I beat the crap out of Dylan McQueen because well, Dylan wanted to. So Dylan used to ask Cody all the questions. Hey coach Cody. Hey coach Cody. Hey coach. Co- what about me? You know, I, I was running a successful facility way before Cody got involved, but yeah. I digress. Right. As Taz would say, I digress. So uh, we brought Dylan to TV and, you know, I talked to Tony Khan. We asked to have this match because it's one, I wanted him to get a true learning experience at AEW. On top of that, I wanted to send Cody a message. And if you didn't get to take a look at it, you should, because I definitely sent that message. So I don't know how long we'll be see Dylan, but. Uh, Maybe he'll be back eventually. Yeah, we'll see. All right, great. So. I'll let you get going. I want to thank you. Really, really appreciate your time. Wednesday night, about 48 hours from now. Hopefully yeah. we're uh, hopefully we're drinking champagne, celebrating your big win over Cody. Wednesday right. night, AEW Blood and Guts on TNT. QT Marshall, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. Good luck.